next thing you know, we're having issues with swallowing and we're aspirating and we're just going down this whole thing from a cold. Hello, you're listening to The Rare Life. I'm your host, Madeline Cheney, and today we have the story of Evelie. Evelie is quite medically complex with several diagnoses, but she has no umbrella diagnosis or syndrome to group it all together. So while she's not lacking in diagnoses, she is undiagnosed. I think there is a lot to be said for those in the undiagnosed community. It is rare to the max. So I'm super excited to share her story with you today. In this episode, Tamika, Evelie's mom, shares what it was like to deliver Evelie and find out that she was born with no eyes. They took her home from the NICU thinking that blindness would be her only struggle. She shares what it has been like to discover diagnosis after diagnosis. She also tells us the ways that she is perfectly suited to be Evelie's mama and the impact of the realization that they have been living a pandemic lifestyle for five years to keep Evelie safe and healthy. I think that last one is an especially important aspect to address for all those listening that have also been living with sanitizer and grocery deliveries and masks long before it was the norm. You are seen and you are not alone. Tamika lives in South Carolina with her husband, Jonathan, and three beautiful girls, Luna, who is seven years old. Evely, who is five, and Skye, who is four. She is a full-time mom and homeschool teacher. She was previously a full-time vocalist performing in live shows and is now returning to that part-time, which is so cool. Tamika is a lover of music and biking. Let's jump in. Hi, Tamika. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. You are so welcome. I'm so happy to have you and to be able to chat about your life with Evely. I would love to start out with just kind of an overview of Evely and her medical stuff she has going on and a little bit about who she is as a person. Okay. Miss Evely is five years old. I guess you could say she's a Christmas baby. She was born December 23rd. So that was fun. (laughs) 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 She has several diagnoses. Evelie was born with anophthalmia, um, meaning that she was born without eyes. She has microcephaly. She has epilepsy. She has CHD. She's completely G-tube fed. She has low muscle tone and um, sleep apnea that's been corrected by surgery, thankfully. And, you know, there's a few other struggles with feeding and things like that, but it all kind of ties in with the low muscle tone and and all of those things. Um, As far as her genetic diagnosis, we don't have one. Mm -hmm. So it's just this whole... Um, umbrella of diagnosis that we have with no way of knowing if or how any of it is linked to each other. Yeah, which is like, you know, this podcast is for parents of children with rare conditions. And so I, Mm -hmm. you know, those of you in the undiagnosed category, like that is the ultimate rare. And, you know, I think we can all feel for you because, you know, it's frustrating enough to have lack of research like man there's only like two medical papers about this or like Mm -hmm. I only have like a hundred other kids to look at to know what to expect and the doctors don't know the name of it but like to not even have any of that I mean you know we'll talk about it more in your special topic episode but that advocacy and kind of figuring out what the heck you know you need to do for her must be you know next level it is it's frustrating would probably be an understatement um, because you go and you seek advice or information from medical professionals and they're unable to give that information to you because it's not there or because 
you know, the situation is so rare. So not knowing what to expect because everything with Evely, just to give you a little bit of background for her medically, I had no idea that Evely had any differences before the day she was born. Up until the day she was born, I thought I was carrying a healthy child. Mm. So the day she was born was a bit of a shock yeah. when she was born without eyes because we know that people are born blind. That's not something that, that you don't see that often. Mm -hmm. However, it just took my brain a while to just really fathom her not having eyes. That was really tough for me emotionally because Evely was my second child. And one of the things that I really loved the most about being a mom to a newborn was those first several months of breastfeeding. And it's just you and your baby and you're just bonding and you don't have these words, but you just kind of gaze into each other's eyes while you're feeding your baby. And I talked about that a lot when I was pregnant with Evely because I couldn't wait to do it again. I was still nursing Luna when I was pregnant with Evely, but by this time, Luna was an acrobatic toddler. That was, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it wasn't so like cute and intimate anymore. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so um, I was really looking forward to that with Evelyn. So mm. she was born in the morning and we got the official diagnosis that night. Because once again, anophthalmia is something that you don't see mm -hmm. regularly. There were a few doctors, you know, that would say, that's one of those things that we hear about in med school, but you, you never, mm. you don't see it in your career. So um oh. We were in the NICU with her for five days. So okay. um, that's why I said it was fun when she was born because we spent Christmas in a NICU. Oh. <laughs> yeah, with a toddler. Uh, also, oh when was gosh. 18 months old. But when we left, we were under the impression that blindness would be Evelyn's only struggle. Right. So I'm going home mm. thinking, okay, people who are blind, live amazingly beautiful lives and she'll just have to adapt and we'll just have mm -hmm. to adapt and we'll just have to get her this and we'll just have to do that. And all of these things, you know, I'm trying to work through postpartum hormones and <laughs> the shock of your, <laughs> the shock of your baby being born without eyes and mm -hmm. um, just the whole Nick, you stay during a holiday and all types of things. Mm -hmm. But we would learn months later that, you know, blindness definitely would not be her only struggle. And we are continuously learning things about Evely. Evely's most recent diagnosis was just January of last year. Oh, wow. So it's just been time after time, diagnosis after diagnosis, where we're learning different things. And that is what makes it extremely frustrating because we have no idea what to look for next, what to expect next because yeah. she's undiagnosed. So yeah. we have zero idea if last year's diagnosis, which was the epilepsy, is going to be the last one yeah. or what's next. I feel myself being stuck in that mentality. Sometimes you don't want to stay mm -hmm. there when things are going kind of smooth mm -hmm. and you're just like, man, this has been way too smooth. For yeah. Two <laughs> like what's going to happen? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. When I like that receiving, cause we had a similar, I mean, like it was different because we had some idea of what to expect because our child has a syndrome, but like we did receive a few surprise diagnoses after the other ones that already felt like too much, right? Like you're already yeah. trying to figure out how the heck to deal with the other things and then to like keep getting more. It was excruciating for me. I want to hear a little bit about like, what was that like for you? Like on the emotional level to have so many things one after another over the span of her five years of life. Yeah, it has been traumatic mm -hmm. um, in a lot of different ways. 
And like I said, it's just that whole thing in the back of your mind where you're wondering what's next and yeah. you have to kind of like train yourself to not do that so that you can be here right now where we are in this moment right here instead of thinking about the next moment. But it, it was really hard. It was very emotional. And it, I felt like I was still processing the fact that she didn't have eyes. And then, boom, we're in the hospital for 30 days for heart failure. Mm. And they're telling us all of these things that's going on with her heart. Two holes in her heart, pulmonary hypertension, a severe leak, part of her heart being enlarged, her not having any traditional symptoms. It, it just made everything scary during that hospital stay towards the end of that hospital stay is when microcephaly came into oh, wow. play. You know, the only thing I have ever up until that point had ever heard about microcephaly was not good, mm-hmm. you know, at mm-hmm. all it was extremely scary. So I wasn't sure what they were saying exactly when they were giving me the information about the microcephaly. And Mm -hmm. I'm just like, are they, are they telling me that, you know, she's going to die soon? Because that's Mm -hmm. the only thing that I had ever seen or heard regarding microcephaly. Oh my gosh. It was just one thing after another, after another, after another. And so you know, just going through the motions and then boom, another diagnosis. And then you're just like, okay, well, how do we work through this now? And and I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm still learning about this one. And Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe I slowed down with learning about this one, because obviously when heart issues and microcephaly is thrown at you, then you're not really thinking about the blindness a whole lot. (laughs) So. Yeah, where it's like life threatening. So you're like, that is the that's the priority. Like, we'll put that on the back burner. Yeah. So totally. (laughs) So um, it was just you know thing after thing after thing again, and here we are a year and a half post our most recent diagnosis, and I'm just like, at this point, can I even like mentally handle? something else or what's next. Sometimes I get so afraid to get comfortable where we are. Mm -hmm. I'm just feel like I have to be ready for the next thing. Just be mentally prepared to hear the next thing. And that is so like exhausting Mm -hmm. to try to prepare yourself in a mental way or an emotional way to hear another diagnosis for your child. Yeah. So yeah, extremely tough, extremely tough. And I, you know, and I can't say it would have been easier one way or another, just getting them all at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, maybe I didn't want to know all this at the beginning. (laughs) So um, I was very frustrated about some of the things I felt like maybe we should have been able to pick some things up with ultrasounds and things of that nature. And then I could have you know, had the opportunity to research and Mm -hmm. to prepare, you know, certain things for her to be ready for her when she came home. So Mm -hmm. that our home and that the space and that the environment would be, would be ready for her. That is something that, you know, early detection, it's always this thing when I, when I'm talking to other moms who just receive news, like while they're pregnant Mm -hmm. and, you get this time to process. Mm -hmm. And again, not saying that it's easier because you're hormonal either way, you're hormonal, (laughs) whether you just, (laughs) whether you're pregnant (laughs) or you're hormonal, whether you, you know, but personally, um, just being someone who likes to feel prepared for certain things Mm -hmm. and, and who knows, maybe that's what Evelyn, one of the many lessons that she's here to, to teach me is that you won't always be prepared in ways that you think should be, Mm. Um, but, but just, you know, be ready. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that makes me like think too, do you feel like there are other ways that you were like 
prepared to be Evelie's mother? Like, are there experiences or attributes that you see in your past or in yourself that have been really a great asset to you as her mother? Yes. Nursing school. Oh I went gosh. to yes, I went to nursing school and loved being a nurse, loved mm-hmm. providing care for others. Nurturing comes really naturally to me, but I wasn't a huge fan of the system as a whole. Mm-hmm. So I pursued music after I finished getting everything squared away with nursing school and passed the state board and did some in-home nursing care for a little while. But ultimately, I continued doing music. That's where my heart and soul was. And that's what that's what I followed, which ends up working out for me with Evelie too, because we always say that music is Evelie's first language. Wow. And now I realize that nursing school was for Evelie, absolutely a hundred percent for her because so I, cool. I never used it, you know, mm-hmm. like that for a while I worked as a nurse, but not long enough to, you know, to say, oh, this is why I went to nursing school. Wow. Um, but nursing school, looking back now, that was definitely for her. So wow. everything with machines and tubes and giving medication and changing things and everything. Her G-tube comes out and stuff. We don't even have anybody here following us for her G-tube site because I handle it all. I handle all of that myself. So it's one less doctor appointment that we have to go (laughs) to. You can be the doctor for that. That (laughs) is like so cool. And I love how You take your nursing experience, your nursing school experience, and combined with your musical experience, and like (laughs) that is like the ultimate, the ultimate mom for her. That is so cool. It really is. It is the ultimate mom for her. Music is Mm. everything for her. Everything. I love that. Music has gotten her through really, really tough times. It's gotten us through every hospital visit. It's gotten us mm-hmm. through some scary exams and just different, you know, unfamiliar spaces and faces and places and everything. It just music just really helped calms her and soothes her. So mm-hmm. yes, music having <laughs> having a mom with a musical <laughs> background and a nursing background. And this was like, Emily was like, okay, that, that's the one. She, I'm going to her. <laughs> she's, she's got me. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Well, tell me more about, you say that music has helped her get through hospitalizations and things like that. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Is that like you singing to her or is that her listening on headphones or something? It's a combination of both. It really just depends on what the situation is. If we are in situations where she's in the hospital and she's recovering from a procedure that wouldn't allow me to be able to touch her right away. Such is such a huge part of her world um, because she's completely blind. So recovering from heart procedures, you can't just scoop in and, you know, grab your baby right away. So singing to her during those times just so she would know that I was near just so she know that I'm close by um, that really helped mm. during certain other appointments it might be putting headphones on and just playing some of her favorite tunes or some of her favorite artists during those appointments so it really just depends on what the need is for her during that during that time and mm how upset she is. (laughs) (laughs) I love how attuned you are to that. Have you found that it helps you too, to be able to sing to her and like nurture her in that way during those hard times? Absolutely. I think it helps calm me down as well because you're so focused on making sure the vibrations and the energy is right for your child. In order for me to be able to do that with her, in order for her to truly feel that it has to be real. That's one thing that, you know, I always say about it, like you can't 
fake the funk with her. You know, sometimes we are going through certain things and we put on this mask and put on this facade for our children mm -hmm. so that, you know, we don't want to worry them and we don't want them to see us a certain way. And Evelyn can feel it regardless. Mm. Wow. And I know that she can feel that. So I have to do what I need to do. And so it definitely helps to bring me down in those situations as well so that I can help bring her down. Wow. That's amazing. And I feel like that must just be an extra motivator to take care of yourself and to make sure, like you say, that you are in the place you need to be right. and even to help her be in the place she needs to be. Right. Um, so, you know, kind of segueing into that, can you share, you know, your experience when the pandemic hit and kind of the realizations that you had about your life and your well-being? Yeah, when the pandemic hit, there was a lot of different things that happened with me, I guess, like mentally and emotionally, physically. Initially, it was a kind of like, great, it's one more thing for us to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, this whole life of everything is, you know, disgusting and germs and not being able to be around, you know, a lot of people, not going out during certain times of the year, each year between November and March, we call it, you know, our little hibernation season. Mm. So we were just coming out of that when COVID hit. So we were just oh kind of like, oh, finally, because usually we try to wait until the weather is consistently nice so we can be like outside and mm. things like that. We scale everything back on doctor visits during that time to keep Evelie out of hospitals unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, my husband generally works from home that time of year just to keep the exposure down. Mm -hmm. So that whole part of COVID was nothing new to us. We had this whole stash of, you know, surgical mask in our bathroom wow. closet already that we were always sent home with after certain procedures, after certain mm -hmm. procedures, especially dealing with Evelie's heart. So that part of the pandemic, we were kind of like, oh, well, we're the OGs of this. Like, <laughs> we got this. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. This is, <laughs> this is nothing new. Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. But the, also the reality of that really stung a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like there's a whole pandemic going on right now and literally nothing changed. So that was kind of a ouch moment for me because then hearing people discuss all of the plans and hopes and dreams or whatever all the things they were going to do you know post pandemic and I think that was when the reality of this is this is our life I think that's when it finally set in because we kind of hit the ground running everything just went so fast after Evely was born. It was like, boom, we're in the hospital, you know, for this and then this and then this. And then between all of the doctor's visits and all of these therapy sessions during the week, you don't really have the time to stop and actually process everything that's going on. Because when you do have a moment, you're spending that time researching or you're spending that time you know, trying to figure out how can I better serve her? How can I be a better mom to her? How can I be the best caregiver? How can I help her reach her full potential where she is right now? So you don't really get that moment. Well, then COVID happens. And the one big change, I guess the only change for us was the fact that we weren't being thrown into all of these doctor visits and thrown into all of the therapy sessions, which meant that we had, you know, this time and hearing everybody, family, friends, whoever, people on social media, they even have whole threads about post-pandemic ideas and post-pandemic parties and stuff like that. And I was like, well, 
we still won't be doing those things. There's been, you know, several things that I've wanted to be a part of over the last few years of friends and family that, you know, I've had to say, you know, no, we can't do that because we have to keep Everly healthy. Yeah. So like I said, it's stung really bad. And it really sent me into like a really, really, really like depressive state Mm. because I was like, wow, you know, you see articles and things about advice and stuff for how to, I guess, live during a pandemic. And I'm just like, our lives is a pandemic. (laughs) So (laughs) like, and so um, it really, you know, I really struggled with that. I'm still, I'm not going to lie. I'm still struggling um, with that. So that was really, really hard. I guess living through the pandemic itself wasn't hard for us because it's what we've done, Mm -hmm. but just the whole realization of this, this is it. Like, this Mm -hmm. is my life and this is, you know, how it's perceived, I guess. Right. So it's perceived as, you know, a pandemic. So just, you know, trying to have been working through that throughout Mm -hmm. the pandemic. (laughs) Well, like hearing people complain about it and like oh my god is that like so hard (laughs) let me tell you one of the things that I have openly said like to friends um I was like yo I really cannot wait until this is over so people will just shut up about it (laughs) like like, stop complaining (laughs) it's like seriously stop complaining like it it really isn't that bad (laughs) yeah and it's like you're dealing with like one aspect of my everyday life where like they're not dealing with all the medical fears and like all the appointments and just all of it like they're not dealing with any of that stuff it's literally just the like staying home part it's just literally the inconvenience of it (laughs) yeah yeah oh man and I, I remember like when it first broke out I kind of asked like I think on Instagram or something other parents like what do you guys think of this? <laughs> you know, and a lot of them were like, guys, get over it. Like, this is this is nothing compared to what, yeah. you know, we go through, or we've been through. And even if they're not the ones that are also needing to be home more in kind of that pandemic lifestyle, but even yeah. just like just the trauma and the different things that we go through, it's like, guys, this is nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I try to have grace and mm-hmm. give grace in those situations, but, you know, I, I <laughs> After a while, after, after a while, I was just like, okay, no more grace. Can we just no more? <laughs> because it gets to end for you eventually. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, and it probably, like you say, it probably just stings too because you're like, ouch, like this is what I lived through. Yeah. You know, and hearing yeah, them and talk about it like that. That really affected my mental health a lot. Mm. Hearing and seeing. And uh, and a lot of people just confirming some of the things that I already thought and already knew. And Mm -hmm. that was kind of like disheartening, which, you know, you don't want to think that the majority of people don't care about other people. But honestly, that's how we got here. That's how we got to the point where, you know, I was like, okay, well, I can't take Evelyn into grocery stores anymore because Mm. people are disgusting or Mm. I can't do this anymore or I can't do this anymore because, and it's probably the nurse in me, but I've always thought it was so inconsiderate of others to be out and about, especially in spaces and places where there's food Mm -hmm. or things that people are going to consume when you are sick and you know you're sick especially yeah. in this day and age, we have way too many options to make things convenient yeah. for us. So I, I would take my kids to the children's museum and I was very like strategic about when I would go. I would mm-hmm. never go in the mornings because that's when it was most crowded certain places that I would take my kids to, I would learn their cleaning and sanitizing schedules and say, okay, well, we're going to go in right after this. But there was one time 
where there was a young lady that was there with her child and she answers a phone call and she's like, oh yeah, we're just hanging out at the Children's Museum while I wait for, she was waiting for results to see if her daughter had strep throat or not. Oh my God. And I'm like, why on earth would you bring her to yeah. the Children's Museum while you're waiting? So this was years ago. So this mm. is when I was just like, okay, so I'm going to have to get extremely creative because I want my children to be able to do all the things, but I also yeah. need for Evelyn to be safe and for Evelyn to be healthy and mm. people do not care. That was something that was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. People just being so, I don't know, just like, mm -hmm. it's just too, like I said, it's too easy. It's yeah. so easy for me to be like, okay, well, you know, I'm not feeling well today. So I'm just going to, you know, have my groceries delivered to my door right. or have something delivered to my door. And we've mm -hmm. been doing this for so many years as far as having food mm -hmm. delivered, but it was because one of the times when Evelyn was in between hospital stays and I was out with them going to get groceries and I was just like, why are sick people in the supermarket? Like, why yeah. are you here? Yeah. <laughs> why? Yeah. Why? And I try to be empathetic and I try to give grace and say, well, maybe they don't have the support or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, this, but like I said, there's just so many options that make, mm -hmm. to make that easier for us now. Yeah. And I, I think that part of the frustration, at least for me, so a little background really quick, my, my son was hospitalized several times just for having a cold because yep. with his nose, he couldn't breathe. And so, um, I think it also just feels like, well, for that mom, she either doesn't realize or doesn't care that our world exists, like that right. there are these people who would be hospitalized, could die from the things that are just not that big a deal to them. But it's like, right. I think it really feels isolating in a way, too, because it's such an invisible world to so many it people. Is. They it's just don't realize. It's extremely isolating. It is definitely one of the most isolating experiences I've ever had because mm. It's like you said, either they are just like completely oblivious to it or they just simply do not care because it doesn't affect them. Right. So Evely has also been hospitalized for, you know, being exposed to the common cold. Mm. So, and I'm talking about like, couldn't breathe, mm. ended up having the G2 replaced. She had had it taken out because she was doing so well. And wow. then this cold comes in and rocks her entire world. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, we're having issues with swallowing and we're aspirating and we're just going down this whole thing from a cold. Yeah. Now people will send their kids to school with colds and mm -hmm. people will go out, they go to work, they, you know, they go anywhere mm -hmm. with the cold. So I, I just, I don't know if it's, like I said, if it's just, them not caring because it doesn't affect them or them just being completely just, you know, we don't know. Yeah. So, and either way, it, it stinks. Like either way, it's yeah. like, ouch, <laughs> either way, you it don't realize <laughs> or you don't care. Like both of them are yeah. like, yeah. And I, I do think that that was really like magnified during the pandemic. Um, you know, yeah. just even things like masks or social distancing, things like that, where it's like, if it's not directly affecting someone, a lot of people have like a hard time making those sacrifices for each other. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's, it's sad, but yeah. Yeah. It, it is very sad. And, you know, like I said, <laughs> how many people are going to be at this event? That's one of the things that, you know, <laughs> I've been saying for a long time before making the decision, whether or not, that, you know, okay, we can do this or, mm -hmm. okay, we can go or, you know, when there are certain things that are going on in the community, if it's like a full weekend thing, we always take our kids like at the very end of it when there's mm -hmm. like nobody, <laughs> when there's <laughs> yeah. like nobody there. Yeah. So it's just, you know, you have to be so strategic with everything, but that is why it becomes so isolating mm -hmm. because when others aren't, affected by it then you know that's work you know mm -hmm. and I mean at the end of the day how many people are really gonna just be willing to put in the work yeah 
it's not easy at mm-hmm. all and very very isolating and then the few people that do understand you you can never realistically have time with them either because they're busy going to therapies and doctors (laughs) yes like how are we supposed to socialize with each other we can't it's just you know (laughs) Yeah. yeah I can't tell you how many you know moms that we we may have like a, a therapist or something like that in common mm. and we'll be like oh my god are you you're dealing with you know maybe not the same thing but the the struggles are are similar mm. and the isolation mm-hmm. is the same the fear is the same you know at the end of the day we're all like not sleeping or <laughs> we're all <laughs> so and we say okay well you know let's get together and it sounds great when you say those things, mm-hmm. but the reality is, it's nearly. I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've met one of them like in person mm-hmm. yet, because social media is so great because you can kind of do it at your own time or whenever mm-hmm. you have that moment, and then they can just see it when they have the time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <So>. yes. <laughs> but yes. yeah, it's it's just so so isolating you just feel like you're stuck in this you know little box and Mm -hmm. nobody gets it and nobody understands yeah yeah so the pandemic has had its challenges Mm -hmm. definitely has had its challenges yeah and I you know when you talk about like the isolation and stuff and I I know that that is one of the number one struggles that all of us fight and I think that you know, when you find the other parent that understands some aspect of it or, you know, the the essentials, like the appointments, the lack of sleep, yeah. even feeling the isolation, right? Like all yeah. those things. It is so wonderful. And that is the main motivation behind having this podcast, right? So where yeah. I know you're a podcast listener where you can enjoy those relationships. Yes. Maybe one sided where like they may not know you as you're listening, but like you feel like you know them and that's like, you know, that's something. Yes. And you can listen on your way to appointments or whatever. But it is so huge though. It it, yeah. it is I think it's such a huge part of our worlds. Like I I enjoyed I am like you said I'm a podcast listener mm-hmm. and I enjoy listening to other parents and you know I'll hear them say certain things and it's just like oh my God they're inside my head. Like yeah it's always so bittersweet for me. I don't know how that is like for you, but it's always like so bittersweet because it's bitter because you know how hard it is. You know how tough it is. And mm. you just hate that for the person yes. you know that's also going through it. Yes. And then you also feel like, oh my God, somebody gets it, you know? Mm. So it's kind of this whole, like, it gets you going through, like, through the motions. <laughs> like, I'm sorry like, that you get it. But I'm also glad I, you get it. I know, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm glad you get it, but I hate that yeah. you get this. Like, I really do. But yes. yeah, so you just, you go through the motions. Um, <laughs> we're hearing other people that just go through similar struggles or that they, mm-hmm. they feel you, they understand, they get it. And mm-hmm. it sometimes sucks that, yeah. that they do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I have to feel like that's such a great note to end on because I'm sure as you were speaking, actually, you know, throughout the episode, I was thinking, man, this is going to be so relatable for so many people. And so I'm just so grateful that you were willing to come on and to share your heart in a you know little window into your life so that we can all feel more connected and hear ourselves in another person. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You can find adorable photos of Tamika, Evely, and their crew on the website, therarelifepodcast.com. Be sure to give Tamika a follow on Instagram at the Diaz Girls. And if you don't follow me yet, you can find me at the underscore rare underscore life. Both those links are in the show notes. Also, be sure to represent your favorite podcast and check out our merch, including the popular appointment day hoodies and shirts on our website. There's a link for that as well. Join Tamika and me next week for her special topic episode all about medical advocacy. 
because of the lack of overall diagnosis for her daughter, she has been relentless in finding answers and giving Evely the care she needs and deserves. It's a gem. Don't miss it. See you then.